Notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading verse 9, 10, and 11 to begin our message here this morning. I want to title the message, No Other Foundation. We find here reading from verse 9, in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God, your God's husbandary, your God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning we do thank Thee for the privilege that You've given us to assemble together. Father, we thank Thee for this week that You've given to us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to serve You, not only for saving us, but allowing us to serve You. Now, Lord, we pray this morning Your anointing and blessing to be upon the Holy Scripture. And Father, we pray that You would speak to our hearts by Thy Word and Thy Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen, and you may be seated. When we come to the Bible, we see that Christianity is wrapped around the person of Jesus Christ. We've been speaking a lot about this subject this year already. And when we consider Christianity, we're talking about His conception, His birth, His life, His death, burial, and resurrection, His ascension, first and the second coming of Christ, His deity, His divinity, His humanity, and His impeccability. There's so many things that we can say and so many synonyms that we can use. As we come here to this text, and I've titled this, No Other Foundation, and this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church. He was the first to preach at Corinth. He actually laid the foundation for the church that was established at Corinth. Now I want you to notice as we come back to these verses that we just read, I'm going to read them again. Now I want you to notice that the apostle presents Jesus Christ as the foundation and Christians are compared to a building in this passage. In other words, we are built upon this foundation. Now, he says here in verse 9, he said, For we are laborers together with God. Speaking of the ministers that's mentioned in the previous verses. And he says in this passage, he said, You're God's husbandary, you're God's building. And there's several ways that God describes His people and His church. And we're going to focus mainly upon the fact that, uh, that we are God's building. And there's a foundation that's been laid. And he says in verse 10, According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, he said, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth their own, but let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. Then in verse 11, he said, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then in the following verses, he begins talking about how to build upon this foundation. And he talks about the fact that we will receive a reward if we build properly upon this foundation. So in verse 9, we find that we are God's building. And in verse 16, we are referred to as the temple of God. Now the Christian, his body or her body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, but we collectively... As the church, we are also uh, the temple of God, the church, the bride of Christ. In verse 10, the apostle says here that he is a wise master builder. That is, he's the chief architect or engineer. And again, he laid this foundation. It says here in verse 10, he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And so, Paul was the first to preach the gospel of Christ at Corinth. And the church was established through his preaching. 
And then he says here in verse 11, he said, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There, there is no other foundation. Now the Bible speaks of another gospel in Galatians 1.8, which is a false gospel. It speaks of another Jesus, <clears throat> another spirit, and another gospel in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1, 2, 3, 2 and 3, but that is a false Jesus. And so Paul laid that foundation and he said there is no other foundation. Then in verses 12 uh, through verse 15, he mentions the building material. It's God's design. He tells us how to build upon this foundation. And he speaks of gold, silver, and precious stones that will be tried and endure the fire. But he also speaks of wood, hay, and stubble. <clears throat> and then he said in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And then again, verse 16 and 17, were referred to as the temple of God. Now I have three things I want to present to you this morning while we're turning to the book of Isaiah chapter uh, 28. Notice as we go back there. I want to, first of all, speak to you about the foundation. This foundation that we're talking about was promised in the Old Testament. And the second thing we're going to look at is that the foundation gave stability to God's people. And number three, this foundation must be built upon, as the apostle told the church at Corinth. Now, first of all, notice with me, in Isaiah 28 and verse 16, that this foundation was promised in the Old Testament. I have an article in a sermon titled, The Chief Cornerstone, which would uh, bring together a lot of verses that, that, uh, that centered around Christ being our chief cornerstone. But notice with me now as we come to Isaiah chapter 28, and I want to read one verse to begin with. And notice with me in verse 16. He said, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. Now again, all through the Old Testament, uh, we find that God Himself, the Father, is referred to as a rock probably 20 or 30 times. And we find also messianic promises back here, in, and we'll read a few of them, but in Genesis 49 and Psalms 118 and many other places, and particularly here in the book of Isaiah. So this foundation was promised in the Old Testament, the, the promise that Messiah would come. It was, and this foundation is laid by God. And if you're taking notes in Daniel 2, verse 31 and through verse 34, and also in that same text, verse 44 and 45, we find that this stone was promised by the prophet Daniel, and this stone would come in the days he mentioned of these kings, which the last of those kings he's speaking of was the, was the, the Roman government. And that this stone, Christ, that when he come, that he would crush other kingdoms and uh, the kingdom of God would be established and it would fill the whole earth. And that's exactly what began to take place in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then when you read in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, you find that when Christ ascended back into the Father's throne, and took his seat at the right hand that he was given a kingdom and power and dominion and authority. So this, this foundation stone was promised here in the Old Testament. Now, I'm only going to read just a few verses here, but in our context we find that God is promising to lay a foundation to show the safety and stability of His people in contrast to what they were doing. Judgment was coming upon them. And what they were doing, they put their trust 
and their security in political diplomacy. And do we not do that today? Nations do that today. Israel, they would, uh, when they would put their trust, if they had an enemy coming against them, uh, they're going to go to the Assyrians or, or they're going to go to the Egyptians. Uh, I mean, after coming out of Egypt uh, from bondage years later, they would, they would have an alliance with Egypt or some of the other nations. And what we find here is that if we back up, he says here in verse 14, he said, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. In other words, they made alliances with other nations because they were fearful. Our nation does the same thing. They'll get as many on their side as they can, you know, and go into war. Well, Israel had forgotten about God and they made alliances with other, other nations and still yet God says, my judgment is coming. He says in verse 15, because you have said we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement, and when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies. In other words, they trusted in lying politicians. We have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. God is saying, trust me, I will be your sure foundation. In verse 16, therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, tried stone, precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth uh, shall not make haste. And then he speaks of judgment in verse 17. And then he says in verse 18, And your covenant with death, uh, and he goes and speaks of their judgment that is going to come upon them. And again, it, when you look through uh, chapter 30, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 29, chapter 30 and chapter 31, you'll see clearly that they did trust in other nations. Chapter 31, verse 1 says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on uh, horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. So the Lord said, Let me lay your foundation." Let me be that sure foundation. And this is a messianic promise. God's saying, I will lay this foundation in Zion. And He did. Now notice just a couple of things here. Notice in this passage, verse 16, I'm chapter 28 now, verse 16. He begins with the word, therefore. In other words, saying, don't trust in alliances of other nations. Don't trust in political diplomacy. He said, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. Jesus Christ, by the way, was chosen of God. He was tested and He was proven to be a sure foundation. And it says here in this passage, uh, uh, he says, a sure foundation. In other words, that which is infallible, that which is certain, and that which uh, is steadfast, it is unmovable. Notice he also said, in our text, he also says that it is a tried stone. Think about this. This stone was tried by the devil in Matthew 4. The first 13 or 14 verses, the devil came and tempted him. This stone was, temp was tried by, by man. You find the Pharisees and the scribes and, and all, they're constantly challenging him. But notice now, he also says in verse 16, he says, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. In other words, a cornerstone is the principal stone that is laid first, and it is usually laid in many cases, if it's a, a, a significant building, it's laid with ceremony, and it is what everything else is lined up on, and it joins walls together. And so, notice just the wording here in this passage. But he also said... He said this is a stone, a foundation stone, is a tried stone, is a precious cornerstone. 
He said, it is a sure foundation. And he said, and he that believeth shall not make haste. Now, we'll find in the New Testament, we'll find passages where it says, shall not be ashamed. That's in Romans 9, Romans 10, 1 Peter 2, and Acts chapter 4 and other places. Or shall not be confounded. So all these different words are used. So what does this mean? Is that those who put their trust in the Lord, that they shall not make haste. In other words, they shall not be fearful. They shall not be alarmed. They shall not be ashamed. They shall not flee, you know, and, and be afraid and be fearful. They shall not be confounded or they shall not be disappointed. God is saying that those who are built upon this foundation, they will not be disappointed. They will not be disappointed. So this foundation stone was promised in the Old Testament. Again, Genesis 49, Daniel 2, and, and Psalms 118. We'll read that in just a moment. In just many places, here in Isaiah, we find that it is promised. But notice with me in verse 17. He says in verse 17, he said, Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet, and the hell shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. We find that Israel had trusted in a false foundation. They trusted in their military abilities, their diplomacy, their alliance with other nations. I mean, nations come together and they say, there's no way that we can be defeated. And so they had trusted in a false foundation. And I believe in this case, there's going to be an Assyrian invasion. And their treaty that they had made with others would not hold up. And then in verse 18, he said, In your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. In other words, they would be trodden down by another nation because they put a false hope in men and would not trust God. Now notice again in Isaiah chapter 8, talking about this foundation was promised in the Old Testament. We have a tendency to lean upon the arm of the flesh, do we not? And God said, put your trust in me. Build upon my foundation. In Isaiah chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 13. And again, a similar passage. And he says here in this, in this particular uh, text, he said in verse 13, Sanctify uh, the Lord of hosts in himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And by the way, if he is, we'll not fear man if we fear God. And he said in verse 14, Let him be for a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gem that's a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he said, And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. In other words, in this text here, again, we see the importance of building upon this foundation and not stumbling over this stone. This stone, the Bible says clearly that those who stumble over it in First Peter chapter 2 and other places that they will be crushed by it. Turn with me to Psalms 118. Psalms 118, if you're taking notes, Psalms 11.3 says, if the foundation be, foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalms 127, verse 1 and 2, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And then in Psalms 82 and 5, you have uh, some truth on this as well. But notice now, here's another messianic psalm. We find in Psalms 118, I'm just going to read a few verses here. Uh, in this passage, I'm going to notice beginning in verse 21. This is messianic. Again, a promise that there would be a sure foundation laid. He said in verse 21, I'll praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner. 
This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And this is, would have a reference to when Christ rode in uh, there on the tenth day of the first month, uh, and, and he entered into the temple. It have reference to that as well. Notice verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. We'll read about that later in Matthew chapter 21. But the stone that was rejected, that the builders, those who are supposed to be building upon this foundation, they rejected this and he said that this stone has become the head stone of the corner. And by the way, in this passage, it's okay, I believe, for you and I to take verse 24 for this day, this Sunday, and to say, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I think it's okay for you to wake up every morning and claim that verse. But you know that verse is referring to the first coming of Christ? When Christ came to bring redemption to the world, that's the context here in this passage. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, and notice here, in Matthew chapter 7, in Matthew chapter 7, another passage in the New Testament would be Luke 2 verse 34, when Mary was told about uh, when Jesus was born, and uh, it said, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And that was so true. Many rejected, many believed, but it was set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Now, notice with me as we come to Matthew 7. I'm going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 24. Now, we're talking about a foundation. Christ is that foundation. And the second point that we're coming to, I started to look at the board. I don't have it written on the board. The second point we're coming to is that this foundation was not only promised in the Old Testament, but this foundation brought and still brings stability to God's people. Notice as we begin here in verse 24, the word therefore. If you back up to verse 13 and 14, he speaks of salvation. And there's only one way to be saved. There's a, uh, there is a broad way that leads to destruction. There is that narrow way that leads to eternal life. He also speaks of false prophets in verses 15 down to through verse 20. And he said, you shall know them by their fruit. And he also speaks unto us what genuine salvation is all about in verse 21, 22, and 23. Let's read that first. Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of, the, uh, of, of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name have cast out devils? And thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. There's a lot of truth here. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, bringing it to a close with this story of two foundations. So he shows us, shows us what true salvation is like. He said in verse 13, he said, many, many will choose the broad way that leads to destruction. And few will choose the narrow way that leads to eternal life in verse 14. But now notice, we have here, there are two foundations. He says, beginning in verse 24, verse 24. He said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built a house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. This is what we're talking about now. Notice with me in verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine, for He taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. And what we have here, we find that a wise builder is not just one that hears the Word of God, but one that obeys and is a doer of the Word. That person is building upon a solid rock and has a hope in heaven. They are upon a sure foundation. This is illustrated very well right here in our area. Dolphin Island. Somebody just asked me last week, said, why do they keep building back? I said, two things. I said, one thing is they ignore the Scripture. They build upon the sand. It's going to move one of these days. And I said, another thing is some people got more sense, more money than they do sense. You know, and uh, I guess people make money off the rentals, whatever, but uh, you build there and it's eventually going to come down. I mean, I've lived here 29, over 29 years, and I've seen the island devastated more than once in, in those years. So we find here bringing this over into a spiritual arena. Christ is the foundation. Now this, this not only has to do with salvation, but this has to do with building our Christian life upon this foundation. The decisions that we make in life. And we've spent a lot of time dealing with this. You see, the foundation is the most important part of the building. You can build a million dollar home and the foundation is faulty. Uh, it will crumble and fall one day. As a matter of fact, the two most important parts of a building, in my opinion, is the foundation first and the roof. You have a leaky roof, you got problems there too, because it'll destroy everything else. And this foundation is the beginning of the building. And so again, the wise person, the, the person who's truly born again, they build upon a rock. We put our we put our trust in the solid rock, as Sister Joanna was talking about and we're going to sing about as well. We put our trust in that. And then not only do we do that, we are to build our Christian life upon that. Whatever that we do in life, we're to build it up on this foundation. Now this foundation, you're very familiar, Matthew 16. Let me just read a couple of verses here. Notice in Matthew chapter 16. I'm reading just two verses, verse 18 and 19. Some of these passages are familiar to us, and I'm going to turn to one in Ephesians. We probably read already three times this year. But notice here in Matthew 16, and I'll just take these two verses. This is where the Lord is speaking to them, Whom do men say that I am? Of course, Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord speaks of His church to be built upon the foundation of, upon the confession that Peter gave. The church is built. And you know what? When Peter, now think about this, when Peter preached in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost to the Jews, you know what he did? He preached that foundation, that there's only one way uh, to be saved, and that's through Christ. And then when he went to Cornelius, if you read in Acts 10, when he went to the first Gentile, what he did is that he preached unto them Jesus Christ. So this foundation must be built upon. And the first mention of the church in the New Testament is right here in Matthew chapter 16. Notice as we read verse 18 and 19. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that is Peter's confession. What is it? Verse 16, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus said unto them, he said, and upon this rock I will build my church, the gate, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We find here in, in this passage, very, very important, is that the church is built uh, upon Peter's confession of the deity and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's built upon Christ. He is that solid rock. And when he speaks of the gates of hell, he's speaking of the schemes and plans of the devil. And the devil is continuously at war 
against God's church as He was against God's Son when He was here on this earth. But notice He said in verse 19, He says, And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys here has to do with the gospel that we preach. And again, in Daniel 2, the passage I gave you earlier, that stone is the foundation of the kingdom of God. He said that in the days of these kings, God shall establish His kingdom. And, and, and this thing would fill the entire world and it will never come to an end. Well, we find here that He, the beginning of His church, He gave the apostles the keys of the kingdom. That is the gospel that they would preach and we find that those keys, as in Romans 1.16, uh, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Uh, we find that keys are, uh, are a symbol of His power and His authority. Turn to Ephesians. We've gotten more familiar with this passage. We've used it a number of times in recent months. But notice in Ephesians chapter 2. You can't preach on this subject without at least mentioning this. And I'm just going to cut into the text here also, but I want you to notice, I'm going to read from verse 18 the importance of this foundation. Also, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2.19, he says, quoting part of that verse, he said, Nevertheless, he said, The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Again, he speaks of the foundation of God. Why is this so important? Because when we, even in the first century, first, second, third century, uh, you had uh, people that we refer to as the Gnostics. They're still here today. The Gnostic teachings is still here today. And what they did, they, they had a, a multitude of beliefs, and it's hard to ever nail them down to know exactly because they even varied among themselves, as many occults do, and, and I would consider them as an occult. But what they did is that they denied, they would either deny the divinity of Christ, or they would deny the humanity of Christ. I mean, they had, a, again, they had a variety of different beliefs uh, among them, but we, uh, the, the Gnostic Gospels that we refer to, we've preached on that, written on it, was written, they were put together or wrote in the 2nd and 3rd century. But the teachings of the Gnostics was there in the 1st century. Paul dealt with it. Uh, Peter, James, and John, uh, we see them dealing with this type of teaching. And what are we talking about? Those who would deny certain aspects of Jesus Christ's uh, deity or His humanity. And here again, people say, well, I don't, I don't understand the Trinity. There's a lot of things I don't understand. But I have to believe what God has said in His Word. And, and if I read in the Word that Jesus Christ was a man, and, and uh, He, the, uh, the man Christ Jesus that went to the cross and died, then I have to believe in His humanity that He was a man. But when I also believe that He was God manifest in the flesh, and that he, he eternally existed and He come from heaven, we've talked about this a lot this year, then I have to believe that too. And the only way I can reconcile them together, I mean, I can't... Many people, they believe one and deny the other. And that was true of the Gnostics in the first, second, third century. And if I see both of these together, you know, then I have to come to the conclusion He was the God-man. He was God in flesh as in John 1, verse 1 and verse 14. I just have to believe that and say, can you explain all that? Well, not exactly. We do our best at it, but we cannot deny any of the Scripture. So notice women in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 18, speaking of Jew and Gentile in one body, as in verse 16. But verse 18, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father, now therefore, if you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Here we come back to that building. Okay? The church is referred to as a body. Christ is head. The church is referred to as a bride. Christ as, you know, the, the, the bridegroom. 
But the church is also referred to as a building. And that's where the Holy Spirit dwells, is inside of His church and inside of every believer. So we are the household of God. And then in verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Those are, those are very encouraging words as we look at those. And so we're built upon the foundation that God had laid, that He had promised in the Old Testament, and the apostles preached this and laid that foundation. Jew and Gentiles joined together uh, by the chief cornerstone. Well, notice now as we come to our third point, and notice in 1 John chapter 4. All right, our third point is that this foundation must be built upon. In other words, it was not only promised in the Old Testament, and we find that it gave stability to God's people as we move into the New Testament, but this foundation must be built upon. Paul said there's no other foundation that can be laid. Now watch this carefully as we come to 1 John chapter 4, reading verse 1, 2, and 3. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now notice this. He said in verse 2 and 3, Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And verse 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Notice many today do not deny that Jesus existed, but they do deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That is, the divine Christ was the human Jesus who lived and walked among men. Many will deny that. And again, we're talking about the Trinity. We're talking about the Godhead. And in verse 2, when he says, Hereby I know you the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The word confess means to acknowledge. To confess something is to say the same thing that God has said. And we would see this notice in verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. So when we confess something, we're just simply saying exactly the same thing that God said about that. When God tells us he's, Jesus is the God-man and that he is God manifest in flesh and things of that nature... When we confess that and trust that, then we believe it. But notice, uh, notice here in verse, uh, coming back to verse 3, and every spirit, this is the spirits inside of men, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is, is it in the world. The spirit of Antichrist was in the world in the first century. And there were many antichrists in the world in the first century according to 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And people say, well, do you believe antichrist is coming? Yeah, he's been here all, you know, there's been many antichrists. And they were in the first century. They're here today. Do we have them in our community? Yes, we do. Those who deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, they're antichrists. Okay? And, and, they, and, and they need to be saved. And the controversy, as we look at this, the controversy centers around many today will just say the Son of God was an historical 
figure as Herod or Pilate or something. They say, oh, we believe that Jesus existed and that He came, but do you believe that He was God in flesh, that He came from heaven's glory to come here to go to the cross and die for our sins? Again, we must come to this conclusion when we see verses that tell us clearly that He was a man. And then verses that tell us clearly that He was divine and we just preached the message a few weeks ago, the pre-existence of Christ. There's so many that He came down from heaven's glory. And that He was in heaven before He was, you know, took upon human flesh. And the problem is, is that facts are stubborn things. We have to come to the conclusion that we accept this and people say, well, I don't understand the Trinity or the Godhead, neither do I. But I believe everything that God said about it. Notice here in this same book, in chapter 2 and verse 22. He says here, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is come in the flesh? I'm sorry, that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now notice this. Who is an Antichrist? Is it some world leader that's going to rise up in the Middle East or Spain and Europe or or, or as somebody I heard recently, uh, he, his headquarters is going to be in Baghdad, and he can't come to power until the U.S. gets their forces out of the... Come on, are you kidding me? He says here, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son... The same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Can't have the Father without the Son. Have you really thought this through? Can't have the... And here's the thing. I'm going to say this. We're going to read a passage in just a moment, if we have time, uh, in Matthew chapter 21, where God told the Jewish nation, He said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, And I'm going to give it to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That nation is the church. And and it's a holy nation in 1 Peter 2.9. Now you think about this. Many today deny, all occults deny the truth about Christ. All Gnostic teachings and Gnosticism is very prevalent among us today. It's in many churches. And so we see that the denial of this, and let me just tell you this. This was the, the reason that Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 was because they rejected the stone. The builders rejected the stone, and that is the reason that Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. And if you go to Jerusalem today, the majority there believe the same thing that they did in the first century. This is not God's chosen people. God's chosen people is the Israel of God. And the Israel of God began with people like Peter, James, and John, and Paul, and Silas, and Barnabas, and Luke, and others... In other words, they were the true Israel of God because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I don't know what people are waiting for in the Middle East, but I'm just telling you, the church is the Israel of God. We are the family of God. And this started with believing Jews. Up until Cornelius, you know, there were thousands saved, 3,000 at Pentecost, 5,000 later, many others, every every one of them were Jews. But they were believing Jews. And the kingdom was given to them. They, they are the true Israel of God. As we, as we look through this, uh, 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 this text here, we see here that Jesus is the name of His humanity and Christ is the title of His deity. Notice in 1 John chapter 5. It says in verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. Notice in 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, reading in verse 1, 2, and 3. We've read this a few times also recently. He said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, 
which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John says, I'm giving you the record of this. He said that, coming back to 1 John 5, he mentions the record that God has given from verse 8 down through verse 13. But notice in verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Notice that. And then in 2 John, notice in 2 John, uh, he mentions uh, verse 7. He said, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And notice now what he says in verse 9. He's going to mention the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? It's mentioned here in Second John 9. And it's also mentioned in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. And when you look at Hebrews, it speaks of repentance, faith, Baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. That is the foundation, uh, you know, uh, of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But notice now as we read in verse 9. He says here in verse 9, He says, Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. It doesn't matter where it's a Jew in Israel or a Gentile in America. If they deny who Christ is and who the Bible say that He is, then they cannot be saved. You cannot have the Father. Those that say, I believe in God and deny Christ, they're liars. They're antichrist. You can't have, you can't have one without the other. You can't have God without the Son. You can't have the Son without having the Father. It's just the way God has laid this out. In the New World Translation of the Jehovah Witnesses, I was talking to someone recently about this. In John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, little a, the Word was a God. See, when you write your own Bible, you can, you can make up what you want to believe. But when you read in God's Word that the Word was God, and then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16 is that God was manifest in the flesh. And so again, you say, well, I can't reconcile. Well, you just believe what they say. Jesus Christ was the God-man. Now notice with me in Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to read here in just a couple other places and we'll close. Notice in Matthew chapter 21. Now I'm not going to read the entire parable. There's a parable here of the vineyard that God planted. It begins in verse 33. He hedged it and digged a wine press in it and let it out to husbandmen. And we find that the Lord... Uh, had uh, sent his prophets and they rejected them. But as you come down to verse 37, it said, Last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. Verse 38, Now he's speaking of the nation of Israel. This vineyard is mentioned in Psalms, I believe it's chapter 80 or 83, and it's mentioned in Isaiah 5. But he says here in verse... Uh, 38, and when the husbands saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. They caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. And when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Now notice carefully the wording. Jesus said unto them, Did not ye read in the Scripture 
the stone which the builders rejected. Now, I read enough in the Old Testament to show you this is in prophecy. He said, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, notice carefully. Therefore, say unto you, the kingdom of God. This is the same kingdom in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. He's speaking to Israel as a whole, the leaders. He says, shall be taken from you and given to a nation. 1 Peter 2, 9, that nation is a holy nation. And he said, and said uh, to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, and the church brought forth the fruits thereof. He said in verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You see, you've got a few options here. You can build upon, you can stand upon this foundation and trust the Lord, and you're safe and secure. When the winds blow and the storms come, uh, the rock is going to stand. But if you stumble over this stone, and First Peter said they stumbled at his words, if you stumble over this stone, this same stone is going to crush you. That's what we find in Daniel and Isaiah and other places. And then he notice this, verse 45 and 46, And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he spake, and by the way, they perceived correctly. And it says, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. And by the way, if you go into the next parable in chapter 22, the, the parable of the marriage and the son, the marriage uh, for the son, a king making a marriage for his son, you'll find that the A.D. 70 is prophesied in verse 7 because it says, And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city, as in Luke 21 and in verse 24. This literally happened in A.D. 70. And it all of this happened. Jerusalem over a, a burned and destroyed over a million die. A few hundred thousand carried into captivity. The temple that was there, it is burned and destroyed that they gloried in. Why? Because they rejected the stone. They rejected the foundation that God was laying for them. Turn with me please to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. You see, 1 Peter 2 9, we'll read it in a moment. We're called a holy nation, a royal priesthood. In Galatians 6 verse 16, the church is called, made up of Jew and Gentile, first Jews and later Gentile. It's called the Israel of God. And in Ephesians 2 19, we just read it, Jew and Gentile, they are the household of God, the household of faith. Romans 9, I'm reading from verse 30. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have obtained to righteousness even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, now this is not every Jew, we'll see that in a moment. Paul was a Jew, Peter was a Jew, not every Jew, it's those who rejected Christ. He said, but Israel which followed not, which followed rather after the law of righteousness have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And verse 33, as it is written, it says here, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, the rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isaiah said they shall not make haste. And, and here in Romans chapter 10, in Romans chapter 10, it used the word ashamed. In verse 11, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And I think another passage, it says, They shall not be confounded. In other words, those that build upon this foundation will, will not fear. They will not be alarmed. They will not make haste. They will not flee. They will not be confused. They will not be disappointed. But they have a sure foundation that they have built upon. 
And even Paul in Romans 11 verses 1 through 5, he says, he says, there is a remnant of Jews. He said, unto this day, he said, I am one of them. You see, they were believing Jews and unbelieving Jews. Just like today in Codin, there's believing Gentiles and unbelieving Gentiles. You have those two groups of people uh, that we find in the Holy Scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, then Acts 4, and we'll close. 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice as we come here. 1 Peter chapter 2. We find here beginning in verse 4. He said, To whom coming as unto a living stone. Don't you love this? Brother Ernie was telling me here recently, he said, I took your article on Chief Cornerstone and preached it. I said, that's fine. I said, that's one of my favorite subjects. We're on sure footing. We're on a good foundation. And But he says here, unto a living stone, disallowed, notice that means rejected, indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Then he said in verse 5, he said, you also as lively stones. Notice that are build up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now what's interesting, verse 6, we're going to read it, is quoted in Isaiah 29, 16. And verse 7 is quoted in Psalms 118:22. we just read. And in verse 8 is quoted in Isaiah 8 and verse 14. So he covers three of the Messianic promises. And he said in verse 6, he said, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now there's that other word I mentioned. What do we got? Make haste. Help me out. Make haste. And what was it in Romans 9? Ashamed. I think disappointed. Confounded. Here we are with this word. All of these are pointing the same. In other words, we will never be disappointed built upon this foundation. And he says here in verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. And that was true of Peter, James, and John. And Anna and Simeon and many, many others. Zechariah and Elizabeth. He said, But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. Verse 8, A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them, now here's the key, uh, which stumble at the word. That's the real issue right there. They stumble at at the word being disobedient, whereto also they were appointed. Now let me read verse 9. Here's the key to this. He said, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's what he called his people in the Old Testament as well. He said that you should show forth praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. And then he talks about their past in verse 10 and their future in verse 11 and in verse 12. One more passage and we'll read in Acts chapter 8. I love looking at these passages. They bring peace and, and stability and security to our hearts. Notice in Acts chapter 4. So what we come to the conclusion of, with this foundation, the chief cornerstone, it is the principal stone. It is the first stone placed or set in a foundation. And the rest of the building is lined up on that particular stone. It binds together all of the walls of the building. So in our case, spiritually speaking, We're to line up on that stone and it binds all of us together as His church. And so there's no other name the Bible tells us. We're going to read right here in Acts chapter 4. Well, there's no other foundation as we've read. There's no other way. Truth or life as in John chapter 14 and verse 16. There's no other mediator the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2 and Hebrews 9. 
There's no other sacrifice, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10. There's no other sacrifice. Now watch this as we bring this to a close. I'm reading in Acts chapter 4. And let me read from verse 10. Peter is challenged again by religious leaders uh, after healing a man. And he says, beginning in verse 10 through 12, he said, Be it known unto you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. That is the man that was healed back in chapter 3. And he said in verse 11 and 12, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Notice he's speaking to the Jewish people. Of you builders. They could have took this stone and built upon it and had a solid foundation, but they didn't do that. And so he says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And he said in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for well, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Do you know there's some prophecy teachers today that are saying they're so focused in on Israel, national Israel, they're so focused in on them, there's some prophecy teachers today that are saying that they don't have to be saved the same way that we're saved. I mean, they've some that's went that far. But let me tell you something. If a Jew believes the same thing today that they did in the first century about Christ and they reject Him, there is no, I don't care uh, who it is, Jew or Gentile, they cannot be saved except through the name Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thy heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That word confess means to acknowledge and to admit and to say the same thing that God says about Jesus Christ. And so, everyone today is on the same footing. Let me tell you something. Israel is not elevated above anybody else at this present time. They must get into God's kingdom the same way that a Gentile gets into God's kingdom. And it is through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and through His name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you stand with me please? Father, we thank Thee this day for Thy love and mercy and kindness. We thank for the privilege that we can come together and preach Thy Word, to sing the songs of Zion and sing the Psalms, and, and Lord, to pray together and fellowship together. And Lord, we just praise You this morning that You have promised this foundation. You laid the foundation and that we're built upon that foundation. And we do not have to fear for our future. Father, we thank Thee for this. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.